Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining me today on this snowy groundhog day. <laughs> uh, um, just wanted to give a minute so people can get on and um, get situated. We're going to get started here in just a moment. I'm Carrie Gatto. This is the Millionaire, Millionaire Real Estate Investor Workshop. And I hope everyone can see my screen. If not, give me a shout or um, let me know in the chat. All right, so um, just so you know, we are recording today. That way, um, anyone who can't be here live, I can share it with them after the fact. Thank you, Lisa. And, um, and once again, today's webinar is a Millionaire Real Estate Investor Workshop. It's based on Gary Keller's book of the same name right here. And so I'm going to suggest that you, if you don't already have it, that you do purchase this book. Um, basically, what we're doing today is an overview of the models and systems that Gary provides in the book, but to do a deep dive and thoroughly understand them, you'll want to read the book. And as we go through the slides, you'll see in the top uh, right corner, upper right corner, there'll be page numbers. So that you can actually refer, if you take down the notes or look at the recording, you can refer to the pages in the book where he fur further expl you know, explains those, um, those topics. All right, I wanna make sure I'm not leaving anyone in the waiting room. Bear with me one second. Okay, I think we're good for now. All right, um, so yeah, the investor workshop is um, an entry level discussion about the possibilities available to anyone who wants to be an investor, the power of leveraging your money and um, to grow your net worth through real estate and providing proven systems with which to safely and methodically implement an investing strategy. So that is why we're here today. It will probably take 30 to 60 minutes depending on the level of interaction and questions. And I will open it up for discussion at a couple of points at which time I invite you to unmute yourself or use the chat to um, discuss, ask questions, make comments. Um, until those times though, please keep yourself muted so we don't have too much background noise. Thank you so much. All right. So let me move on to the next slide. This is just a legal slide you do have to have it in here. When presenting this material, I'm not going to read it to you, but it does have to be in here legally. Um, and for those of you who don't know me, um, again, my name is Carrie Gatto. I have a team called Big Picture Realty, which is a team of Keller Williams. I'm in the Cambridge Somerville office, and that is my contact information. And I hope we can connect one-on-one. -on -one. Um, a little bit about me. So I've been a licensed realtor for um, just over 10 years. I've worked in this market the whole time, um, meaning greater Boston. Um, I graduated with a BA in psychology from Boston College back in 2001. And yes, it comes in handy in real estate, dealing with people. <laughs> um, I also got a master's in film production from Emerson College and with that, went on to pursue film production in LA and lived there for four years, where I actually flipped my first property. And that was my jumping off point. I, I read Rich Dad, Poor Dad, and decided that I wanted to make a living by adding value rather than punching a time clock. And that's where I jumped into real estate and um, started at a smaller brokerage, moved to Keller Williams five years ago and have consistently been in the top 20% of the agents in terms of productivity. And I serve on the Agent Leadership Council, which is, um, if you're not familiar, it's a board of directors because Keller Williams allows agents to take an ownership role in the office. And I've also served as productivity coach as well as, as a realtor. And I am an investor myself. And um, I'll share a little bit more about that as, as we go through this. So um, um, so yeah, so I would love if we could take a minute to share a little bit about why we're all here today, maybe what has caused you to start thinking about investing in real estate, um, you know, why we're here. 
so yeah, so um, feel free to raise your hand or unmute yourself or put it in the ch chat. I'll share a little bit about why I am on this path. Um, so in dealing with, you know, I, t I told you about my first flip experience where I made a little bit of money, decided this is great. I can add value without necessarily trading time for money. And so, um, and then beyond that, started learning more. And just in my experiences with clients, I had noticed that my seller clients, because I working in this market have sold a lot of investment properties, have benefited so much from their income properties, right? Like after like 20, 30, 40, 50 years, they sell these properties and they're, I mean, they're instant millionaires. Um, and, and at the same time, a lot of them would say, well, I wish I had bought more of these at the time because it's so great for me and my family. And at the same time, um, the younger generation who were in the buying phase of their life, whether it's a first home or a second home, a lot of times they weren't really seeing the investment potential of their purchases and they weren't really viewing it as an investment. And so I just noticed they didn't have that mindset around it. And so it occurred to me to start um, having this discussion with people and opening up people's minds a little bit more, even if you're buying a home or selling a home or a residence to have an investor mindset of how can I approach this by, um, you know, that it can really be the financial foundation of our family's life or even um, help us achieve financial independence. And so I kind of just love that part of it. And um, I would also love personally to retire early or have the ability to retire early you know, as much as I love working, I'd love to not have to work. Um, and also my kids college education. That's a big part of it for me. So yes, yeah, so is anyone um, interested in sharing? Awesome. Emily. Hey there, just trying to tell us. I'm Emily. I am down in the Cape Cod and the Islands Market Center. Um, I just bought my first house and it was with this mindset it was you know grandma's house that hadn't been updated since 1972 and we haven't done like major renovations as far as i don't know we didn't knock down any walls or like expand the square footage or anything but um i really went into it just wanting to make it prettier and it's probably worth in two years fifty thousand dollars more than when we bought it mostly because of the market right now because it's crazy <laughs> And so I want to keep doing that. That's my intention. This is my retirement plan. You know, I have an old 403B from the nonprofit I used to work at, but there's not much in there and that's not gonna be enough. And uh, I also want the ability to only work with who I wanna work with and when I wanna work at some point in my life. So that's that's the main goal for me. And um, just super yeah. excited. There's a lot of opportunity down here. There's a wicked rental crisis for year round rentals and then of course we have the summer rental market so there's a lot of uh a lot of chances to make some money down here on the cape that's what i'm hearing good mm -hmm. for you mm -hmm. yeah that's what i mean by buying smart by looking for those opportunities to like build equity mm -hmm. good for you thanks emily and i just want to learn more <laughs> always always and there's always more to learn yeah, Ann, tell us. Oh, Lisa, sorry, Lisa. Oh, sure. Uh, I um, have always wanted to own extra real estate. My dad was a home builder and I like just love looking at real estate my whole life. I own a condo in Somerville that I started renting out when I uh, moved in with my now husband. And it has been amazing to just be collecting that money every month and having them pay my mortgage and taxes and condo fees and have a little bit extra. And there's a million other reasons I would like to own more property. We would like to have a home in Gloucester um, that we could live in and or make money off of, potentially get a place wherever my stepson ends up going to college. So I, I'm sort of all over the place right now. I know it's something I want to do, but I'm trying to figure out what the right path is. And Carrie, I read your book and I loved it. Oh, awesome. Well, thank, thank you. you. <laughs> thank you so much. I appreciate that. Um, yeah, I have a book that I, I wrote here. Um, it's a pretty quick read. Um, so, you know, 
um, maybe before or after you read The Millionaire Real Estate Investor, you might be interested. It's, it's not as detailed, but it's based on my own experiences and, the, and those of my clients. So it's very, very inspirational. I found it to be very inspirational. Awesome. Awesome. I love that. Um, and I see Yvonne um, put in the chat here, um, want financial freedom and get out of the corporate rat race and add value. Cool. I love that so much. Hi, everybody. Oh, oh. hi. <laughs> um, my Go name ahead. is Erica Velez, and I am originally from Queens, New York. Um, I am very new to uh, this line of business but I just started, I'm a newbie for, uh, as a real estate investor, but um, I, my background is a little different. I, I, I haven't, I'm not really familiar with any of this, right? But I know that one thing that I also want to have that financial freedom, um, I just recently finished reading Rich Dad and Poor Dad. So that, along with the, the, million, the Millionaire Next Door, that has expanded my mind to, in so many levels. So because of that, my way of thinking was very negative before, you know? So I now, as I read those books, I decided to invest in myself and get in a coaching program where I can learn more about this line of work and, you know, be able to get out of like, you know, one of the, uh, one of, you know, the, the people that are here, get out of the rat race, you know, because I think that family yeah. is very important. I think that um, we should live our dreams and work for ourselves rather than work for somebody else. So that is why I'm here also. And, you know, I'm just interested to kind of pick out your brains kind of sort of say, and just learn and, yeah. you know, meet with people. And that's why I'm here too. So you're in the right place. Mm -hmm. so Thank much. you for having me. You're welcome. <laughs> okay. So is anyone else? interested to share right now, there'll be another opportunity later on too. Okay. Okay, great. Thank you so much for sharing you guys. I love that. All right, so um, here's what we're gonna cover. Here's the overview. Um, first, we'll discuss the possibilities. Um, misunderstandings is a term that Gary Keller invented and it, it kind of means like limiting beliefs around why people um, might want to invest or might not. Um, so we'll talk about that. And then um, we'll look at the statistics in our local market in Massachusetts. We'll also talk about your big why. So we'll expand and dig a little bit deeper about why it is that you're doing this because that will really power you to reach your goals. Um, then we'll talk about the power of leverage, why, it's, uh, why you, real estate is such a uniquely um, efficient and effective uh, investment vehicle and how it can help you grow your net worth. We'll then talk about the proven systems, what to buy and how to buy. Okay. So the possibilities, um, financial wealth, um, which here is defined as the unearned income so the passive income to finance your life mission without having to work. Um, and basically, I like this because what it points out is that your income is not your wealth. Even if you're Bill Gates, mm -hmm. his income is not his wealth. It's actually what he owns because, and COVID has proved this, you know, even more than ever, your income and your business and your job, that could all change. I mean, it could, we've seen that. and so. It's actually your, your, um, your assets and what you own that makes you wealthy. So using models and leverage, you can invest your way to the point where you no longer have to work if you so choose. It isn't easy and it isn't a secret and it isn't free. You have to choose what path you want to follow and how active in the investment market you want to be. So no matter what you decide, there are proven paths to get to your choice. 
So we'll discuss, like I said, the beginning concepts and overview, and then the book provides all the proven models and systems you would literally need to become a millionaire if that's what you choose to do. Mm -hmm. And so Gary Keller gives us eight myth understandings between you and that financial wealth. So let's take a look at those. There are three personal myths. <clears throat> the first one being, I don't need to be an investor. My job will take care of my financial wealth. Well, we already kind of touched on that. Um, your job is not your financial wealth. And yes, you really do need to be an investor because you don't know what the future holds and your money that you're saving. I mean, it's great to be saving, but it's literally losing value as time goes by, right? However, your assets will appreciate. <clears throat> and then myth number two, I don't need or want to be financially happy. I'm happy with what I have. Um, and maybe you don't want or need to be, but how do you propose to fund your retirement? Give nice things to your kids, take really cool vacations, buy that sports car, take care of your parents. Again, life is full of surprises and do you want to be ready for them? And then thirdly, it doesn't matter if I want or need it, I just can't do it. But the, the thing is that um, you can't predict what you can or can't do until you try and education and then being action based on that education will allow you to do almost anything. The models we provide are proven. You can do it and many already have. And that's one thing I love about real estate is that literally anyone can do it. I mean, everyone from the poorest immigrant coming to this country on up has shown that it can be done, right? People have come out of poverty and done this. There's so many great and inspiring stories. So then the five investing myths. Firstly, investing is complicated. That might be holding you back. Well, the truth is investing Thing is only as complicated as you make it. And using those models, those tried and true models, they'll make it happen. Trusted expert partners also assist you. What we like to call your dream team of you know, professionals around you, your lawyer, your realtor, your mortgage expert, your CPA, um, you know, your contractor, all these people are going to be resources for you. So you don't have to know everything and you shouldn't know everything. You rely on your trusted dream team. Number two, um, the best investments require knowledge most people don't have. However, you can work in a niche that you feel most comfortable in. You know, Emily was sharing that she likes investing in the Cape where she's located. She knows the market there. Um, she knows the neighborhood. She knows the returns. So something you're familiar and comfortable with is not going to be complicated because you already know it. And the more you get into it, the more you'll understand it. Myth number three, investing is risky. I'll lose my money. Here's the thing, here's the thing though. Investing by definition is not risky. In fact, I'd argue that not investing is risky. But again, you have to have some education and then act on it. Myth number four, successful investors are able to time the market. Um, and yet, um, Knowing your models assures that the timing becomes clear on its own. It is always the right time to buy the right property. And then lastly, all the good investments are taken, but every market has its own opportunities. And you know, the, they say the Chinese proverb is the best time to buy real estate was 20 years ago. The second best time is today. <laughs> Love that one. So here's some um, local stats. These are from Massachusetts. And um, these were pulled the end of January. So just a couple days ago. Um, and it's what you're seeing here are single families, condos and multifamilies broken down in, in terms of uh, number of available listing units on the market. And then in the parentheses next to each figure are the, is the, differential from last year, from 2020 at the same time. So they're year over year. And um, 
there's some pretty, uh, it tells a story. So in terms of single families, I mean, what you're seeing is that the available inventory on the market is less than half what it was last year. I mean, that's crazy. And a, a big part of that is that single families are so hot. They're in such high demand right now that everything that comes on is literally getting sold right away. So there's not a lot available. And there's also probably some people who are waiting for the vaccine. So they may not be going on the market, although they would like to sell. They're waiting. Um, so yeah, that's oh, yeah. a pretty dramatic differential, right? And then the average list price for single families, it's up 28%, which is very dramatic. Um, however, the average sale price, look how much lower it is on the average list price. So it might indicate that we have a lot of sellers who are kind of putting it on and seeing what they might get, but they're not necessarily getting that number. And yet the average sale price is up 19% year to date over last year of single families. So they are they are increasing quite a lot and we're seeing that in the market there's a lot of bidding wars and um a lot of over asking sales especially for single families and a lot of that has to do with covid people feel safer in a single family right now than in a condo and this average days on market indicates the pace of the market how quickly are things moving and it's a fast market. We're at 42 days on average, which is 38% less than last year. However, in the condo and the, and the multifamily market, things are a little more stable. Um, in terms of available inventory, it's only 2% less than last year, which is pretty you know, comparable. List price is higher up 15%, but sale price of condo is actually down 8% year to date over last year. So I mean, I don't think we've seen that in a while where condo prices have actually dipped like that. Um, again, I think people are feeling more comfortable in the single family than they are in the condo or, or the apartment at the moment. Um, but hopefully that's temporary. Then average days on market, um, 51 for condos. And over here to the right for the multifamilies, not as many are available and that's typical. Um, it's actually 2% more than last year at this time. And average list price up 17%. And yet the average sale price is only up 3%, which is pretty normal. 3 to 5% is considered a typical appreciation in a healthy market. But again, it's a fast market. So those listings that are coming on, if they're priced correctly, are going to sell quickly. 43 days is the average. Okay, so um, getting back to the big why, which is what um, Gary Keller calls that motivation, that, that purpose for why you're doing this. Um, and we've talked about a little bit already. Um, so again, um, I mentioned that, you know, I do, I would love to retire early. Um, we also are on a mission to fund our kids education. We have three kids, they're age 11, eight, and three. And um, we bought a duplex last year in Maine, which we plan to keep buying similar kinds of properties with similar returns and pay them off early. And that way fund our kids education and our retirement, but we're going to start with the education because that's coming up quick with our oldest being 11. So um, that's why we're buying properties right now. Um, and if anybody else want, would like to share at this point, I'm gonna open it up. I know we have some people who just came in too. I'll go. <laughs> so um, my big why is a little different than I hear a lot of people You know, have kids and that's what keeps them going and making a better life for your children. Um, I don't have children. So my big why has been dog rescue for as long as I can remember, but it used to just be this pipe dream that maybe if I hit the lottery someday, um, I'd be able to do that and get a big piece of land, you know, with barns and whatever and kennels and 
So, you know, it was always this thing that I wished would happen that I had no real path to do when I was in human services. There was just no way making that kind of money, you know. Um, and I got into real estate four years ago and I've already hit so many goals um, as far as buying a house so I could rescue dogs again that had a yard that I could fence that, you know, all that kind of a thing um, and getting involved in a rescue group and fostering and doing that sort of stuff and donating money to them with each closing and my brand is the salty dog group and it's just all kind of snowballing together. And my big why is still the same, but it just now feels like a goal instead of like a wish, you know, um, and I just want to keep going in that line where that's my legacy, you know, um, I don't have the legacy of, of children and, you know, doing things for them. I have nieces and nephews, of course, but for me, it's really all about um, the rescue. And I've found a way to really make that work with my real estate business, which is super exciting to me. And I just want to keep learning more and um, keep heading in that direction. So, and it really does fire me and fuel me like every day. So it's, it's awesome. That's I love it. Perfect. <laughs> yeah. I love how it just connects everything from your personal life and your professional life and gives you purpose and the reason to get out of bed every day. Mm -hmm. Do your thing. That's amazing. So good. And that's what your big why really should be. You know, it's going to drive you through those bad times because um, it's easy to get excited when you're inspired and feeling everything's going great. But it's when, you know, um, things start to go awry, you hit a, a roadblock and a hurdle, that's when you really need to dig into your big why and remember why you're doing this in the first place. It'll get you through those hurdles. And um, you, will, you will reach your goals if your big why is powerful enough. So it is worth taking the time to just journal about it. You know, I liked, uh, what helped me was just brainstorming, just free association, writing about it one day. And then I put it away. And then a few days or a week later, I revisited it and it, and then certain things jumped out at me and re really resonated. Right. And then just percolating over that, you know, it helped me really define what it was. And for me, it's, it's not only helping my family, but helping others to get to that point where, um, like, I think, um, Erica was saying earlier, um, you know, if people are not strapped down by all this financial worry and stress, they're going to then achieve their true purpose in life. They're going to be free to do that and follow their true passions. And so, you know, and again, everyone has that opportunity available to them. So that really powers me through just thinking about that and how, what a ripple effect that can have. So um, I love it. All right. So, um, yeah, so there could be many different reasons. It could be your children. It could be to give to others, you know, um, to leave a legacy of some form. Um, it could be to be a property manager and live off that income. So again, I, I um, invite you to put thought and consideration into that. So after you've determined your big why, then you wanna, um, identify your big goals, which will be the specific measurable targets that fulfill your big why. Um, then you'll learn the big models, which are the proven systems and strategies for reaching those big goals. And then you'll just need to um, come up with the right habits, the big habits and actions that come from following your big models and live them out. And you're living your dream, literally. Moving on to the power of leverage. Um, so real estate is unique in the way that um, in contrast to stocks and mutual funds, money markets and other investing opportunities, real property is what Gary calls an able investment. For one thing, its value never goes to zero. It has an inherent value because land itself is unique, right? There's no like duplicate pieces of land, they're all unique. Um, they have, you know, a point in space. And a home is also gonna have value because someone can live there and people are always going to need homes. Um, also, the, the reason it's unique is that purchasing real property can be leveraged. 
just as you can't live in a stock, you can't borrow money to buy a stock, whereas you can for real estate. And we'll talk more about leverage later, but the, the short of it is that you can get a mortgage on a home, but you can't borrow money on stocks and mutual funds. That's what I mean by leverage. Also, um, anyone can buy it, it's accessible. It's appreciable, it increases in value over time. It's rentable, so you can make money while you're sleeping. It's improvable, you can add value through sweat equity. There are tax benefits, such as the fact that it's deductible, depreciable, and deferrable. It's relatively stable, it's slow to rise and slow to fall most of the time, whereas you'll see stocks jumping all around some days, right? Um, livable, so it's shelter in more ways than one for your wealth and you can live in it. So this um, is a table to just demonstrate and illustrate the, the power of leverage in comparison to other investment opportunities. Um, and by the way, I believe in diversifying your investments. So, you know, I also have mutual funds, for example, but um, again, we're just trying to demonstrate why real estate is indeed so powerful. So, and so exciting. So if say you have $100,000 to invest, or you're looking to make it a $100,000 investment. Well, you could buy $100,000 worth of stock or mutual funds or money market or, or real estate. The cost of buying the stocks is going to be 100,000. It's gonna be a dollar to dollar ratio. Same with mutual funds and money market. Whereas with an investment property, you can put 25% down. And this is if you're not living in it, you'd have to put 25% down. If you're living in it and renting out one of the other units, like a house hack, situation, well, then you can put much less down. I have another webinar about that as well, but um, we'll stick with the example. So $25,000 down, right? 25%. Your carrying costs here, 1 to 4% and 1 to 4% for stocks and mutual funds. Don't have that for money market. For your investment property, your carrying costs should be offset by your rent. So someone else is paying them for you. You're not paying them, in other words. Other costs, um, not nothing for these, but um, investment property, you wanna factor in the 10% vacancy or less, it depends, right, on the market and maintenance. So again, all of that should be covered by the rent and then some. Then let's look at the income um, per year. So in stocks, 8% is about average historically, mutual funds, 10%, money market, only 2%. And in investment property, you should be seeing about 5% in a healthy market. And other income, nothing for these, but for investment property, you should have a cash flow, which is your gross income from the rent minus any expenses, which we've seen up here. And you know, you'd break it all down and make sure you have that cash flow coming in every month. So your adjusted ROI, which is return on investment, looks like this. 4 to 7% from stocks, 6 to 9% from mutual funds, 2% from money market, 20% for investment property. And down here it, at the asterisk, it shows you how that number was calculated. 20% because you're, um, you're putting down only the 25,000. So your 5% appreciation is 20% of your down payment, right? So your ROI is 20% year over year. And that's not, account, uh, not accounting for the cash flow. That's just an appreciation. Potential loss, it could be 100% in stocks. We've seen that happen where, you know, the dot com bust, stock can go to zero. Mutual funds, same thing. Money market, no, because it's low risk and low return. And also um, for investment property, you could see it go as low as 40% of the, of the original value. Um, not likely, but it could happen. But again, it won't go to zero. And this is a little bit more about how, again, that um, return on investment works. So using other people's money, which could be banks, mortgage companies, and owner finan financiers to make money, leverage multiplies your profit. So appreciation and rent are based on total value of property. However, your return on investment is calculated based on the money you invested. 
So again, 25% in this example. And there's the calculation, not taking rent into consideration, assuming your property went up 5% in one year, and that's conservative. You're not adding any value through sweat equity. It's just normal appreciation. So 5% of a hundred grand is $5,000. $5,000 is 20% of $25,000, your original investment. To make the same money, the same ROI in a mutual fund, um, or actually not even the same ROI, the same amount of money in a mutual fund yielding 10% with no costs, you would need to have $250,000 cash, which is a lot harder to come by than 25 grand. So I hope that I hope that successfully illustrates how powerful leverage can be. And this um, graph is um, about how if you're not investing, you are actually consuming. Um, if you're consuming and not investing, you'll only have shadow wealth. It's not real and it will go away eventually. However, if you invest, you always have cash flow and capital. So Warren Buffett, um, I read a book by him and, or actually it was about him, it wasn't by him, but one thing that really stuck with me was how he views each dollar as not just a dollar, but the potential for more money when invested. So like in Warren Buffett's hands, because he's such a great investor, $1 could be $20 in like three years, right? So he holds on to his money tightly. He does He's known for not being a big spender because he views money that way, right? So that's what, um, that's kind of the mindset you want to have as an investor is you want to invest, pay yourself first before you go and consume or spend. And um, this further illustrates, again, the power of leverage. So as time goes by, you bought your property year one, and then the double, um, the double action of the price appreciation and the debt pay down is going to cause you to have an equity buildup in that property. So over time, the property value goes up, it appreciates, and your debt goes down because your tenants are paying down your loan, right? Which is amazing. Um, some people say that investing isn't worth it if they're only cash flowing like $150 a month on the rental income, because they're overlooking the fact that someone else is paying your loan down. Effectively, you're putting someone else's money into your savings account every month. But that is not all. We also have the cash flow. So as your as time goes by, your rents will also go up, right? That's what happens. Rents don't go down, they go up. With the exception of in Boston and COVID the past year, they did go down 10%. And yet over time, because we're talking about long-term hold here, we're not talking about quick flips, right? We're talking about long-term buy and hold. So over time, your rents will go up and your debt service will stay the same because you're going to have a fixed mortgage payment until it's paid off. And that point, your cash flow goes way up. You don't have to pay down the mortgage anymore. So it's it's kind of a twofold um, benefit over time of leverage. And I um I just saw this happen for for our family. We have a two family that we bought um, back in 2014. The rent has gone up every couple of years, keeping pace with the market. And um, we refinanced last year and now, because uh, of the low interest rates, and now our rental income is greater than our mortgage. So we have one unit, you know, we're living in the other unit and they're paying our mortgage and then some. So we're basically getting paid to live in our house, which is amazing. <laughs> so um, yeah, that's kind of the magic of, of the buy and hold situation. So just to review, um, why do people invest in real estate? Return on investment, tax write-offs, growing their net worth through equity, college education savings, and many more reasons. There's literally no better method of investing your money. Okay. 
Um, this is some examples of the tax write-offs. Obviously, um, I'm not a CPA, so you'd wanna check with your own CPA prior to investing, but these are some of the possibilities. And as I mentioned before, your CPA is literally like one of your dream team. So you're gonna need to be in communication with her and, um, and have someone who's ready to answer any questions you may have as you continue on your journey. So now we're gonna talk about some of the proven systems. And we're gonna start by talking about types of investment properties. So um, these are some of the you know, typical types of properties. You could invest in condominiums, you can invest in single families, duplexes, fourplexes and more. Um, but as I have here um, in Massachusetts at least, and this might be different in other states, but here in Massachusetts, if you go four and more units, it's actually considered a commercial loan. Um, so just to bear that in mind, that the mortgages will be a little different. Um, so what are the pros and cons of investing in condos? Well, typically there's a lower purchase price than a single family home. Um, exterior maintenance is probably included in the HOA fee and you might have more amenities. The cons, those HOA fees might mean less cash flow for you every month. And you only own a percentage of the land. So you share ownership and liabilities with the other condo owners in the association. Um, typically around here, they're small uh, condo associations. Those are the bulk of this market, and but it could be in a big building too. And less appreciation, that kind of depends on the neighborhood, the setting, whether it's urban, suburban, whatever. So single family homes, easiest to resell is a pro. Um, they're typically surrounded by owner occupants, meaning the neighborhoods are kept up and well-maintained. More appreciation, because there's always a demand for single family homes. Cons, well, there's only one unit to generate income. So you lose a tenant, you have 100% vacancy. Duplexes, um, they're typically close to or in single family home neighborhoods. Again, depending on whether you're in the suburbs or in the more urban areas, more cash flow than single family homes. Cons, lower appreciation um, than single family homes and usually surrounded by other rental units. Now you're looking at, we could look at three families too. Um, that's not included here, but three families have, you know, similar to cons and pros and cons to duplexes, um, but you have one more unit to help carry your, um, your costs of owning the property. Um, <clears throat> so that is another option. But when you get to four plexes and higher, um, you're gonna be looking at a commercial loan product, but there's a possibility for higher cash flow, um, fin minimizing financial impact from having a vacancy and also economies of scale, you know, like having one insurance binder for, for four units or having one contractor do repairs at the same time on all four units, things like that. Cons, you have more upkeep, more potential tenant damage, more turnover, perhaps less appreciation and the possibility for tenant conflicts because you got more people under one roof. Um, so these are kind of the proven systems that you'll want to think about um, to move forward in investing. Just a simplistic look, obviously, but the first stage to investing is learning your particular market. Most investors buy within 19 miles of their primary residence. So if that's you, you need to look at your market, learn the investment models and choose your criteria. That can be a long discussion, best done one-on-one. -on -one. And you might not want to you know, invest in your market. I mean, Greater Boston's naturally very expensive and there are other markets that might have a better um, price point, better return for you. Um, I think I already mentioned, but we bought a duplex in Maine, in Waterville, Maine, which just happens to have 
you know, lower, lower price points. We bought it for 142 and our rental income is 1800 a month. And those numbers just really work. Um, so that's a nice investment opportunity. Um, and then finding opportunity could be done through your contacts, your network, friends, coworkers, family, your realtor. We help you discover potential properties that look like they might meet your criteria. And then you want to learn how to make deals. And this is where you examine the home, see if it fits your investment model, make an offer to purchase. When you work with me as your realtor, I'll help you look over all the value numbers and remind you of your model to help you avoid getting emotional about it. It is easy to get excited or anxious and that's when mistakes happen. Um, so I have some really great spreadsheets too that I can share with you to um, quickly and easily look at, and look at a property and see if it matches your criteria. So mortgages. Um, you want to know your mortgage options as you get started. So let's look at a couple of these scenarios. Um, basically, you can opt for a 30-year versus 15-year. Most people do opt for the 30-year, um, especially with the rates being so low right now. Um, and they will opt typically to put 25% down, not more, because again, rates are so low. Like even if they could buy cash, a lot of investors are not doing that right now. It just makes sense to hold on to the cash and, and use the leverage that's available. Um, however, if you go the 30 year route, you can always put your cash flow back into the property. And I recommend you, you do that and you don't spend the, the extra cash. You just put it right back in, pay extra principal and you can pay it down early. Um, that way you're going to accelerate that equity buildup and you're gonna get to your goals quicker. Um, Qualifying issues. So one thing with COVID that has happened is that mortgages have been, I'd say, not necessarily harder to get, but they are being very, very anal <laughs> um, when they're looking at your finances. That the, um, I went through it last year, and especially as a small business owner, they really uh, kind of like take you through the ringer. But, you know, you just, you just, respond and give them all the information and you know in the end it's worth it um but you want to get started talking to your mortgage person sooner rather than later because what i found on my journey is they might have suggestions to help you improve your credit score for example so even if you're not looking to buy till next year or two years down the line they might say well look if you pay off this debt or pay down this debt you can bring your credit score up here and you can get a better interest rate so always get into a conversation with your lender way before you're ready to buy. Like just start talking to them because it will maybe accelerate um, when you can be ready to buy or improve your standing when you are ready to go. So um, if you need a mortgage expert, I have some great people I can refer you to. Um, also, so your first property, what to expect. I would say a lot of times your first property might be the hardest one. So it's important to get that first one under your belt. And then if you hold that one for a while, pay down the debt or have your tenants pay down the debt, you can then refinance and pull equity out of that one to buy the next one. And that's a really smart strategy. It's like you're buying your next one with like no money down basically because it's all gonna be borrowed. So your return on investment there, it's like infinite. Um, so get into that first one, get a great property, make sure it's the right one, and then use that to leverage yourself and keep building your portfolio. All right, so um, another thing you might consider is whether you're going to self-manage your income properties or hire a property manager. Um, you might be very capable and prepared to manage your own property. And yet in this, mar in, this, in this market, it might not be necessary to hire a property manager because it's such a hot rental market. Typically people just wanna live here. So, um, however, you could also look at hiring one and, and you might be able to profit as well as having them do all the work for you. Then you're not worrying about middle of the night calls, you know, toilet needs fixing. So there's pros and cons to each decision. 
Um, I do have a great property manager in this area. I also know some in different areas as well. And I have an awesome network of agents throughout the country. So your agent's gonna be a great resource for a property manager in the area. You know, um, whichever market you buy in, they're gonna know who the good ones are. And that's the key with a property manager. You need a good one. There are a lot of bad ones, unfortunately. So you need to make sure you have vetted them. Um, and I have um, a sheet of questions to ask your property manager, which I can share with you too, that you can interview someone and make sure they're the right fit for you. And they'll take good care of your property and your tenants. Um, but a property manager will um, make sure you're maximizing the value of the property and make sure your rents are at pace with the market. You have great tenants and also trusted service providers. You know, they'll have those relationships with contractors and handyman and electricians that will um, help you take care of your property in an efficient and an economical way. Because a lot of times that can be really hard to find the right, the right people. So next steps, um, read the billionaire real estate investor talk to a mortgage professional, talk to a financial professional, meaning um, your CPA, also um, a, a, like a actual financial advisor or planner. It's always a good thing too. And let's get together. I would love to talk to you one-on-one, -on -one, learn more about your goals and maybe put you in touch with other resources and help you um, push forward towards those goals and take the next step. But most importantly, you know, take action. Time waits for no one. The time really is now. Um, another great resource I want to recommend, I always recommend this to everyone, is Bigger Pockets Real Estate. Um, amazing podcast. So I just put it on whenever I'm in the car or sometimes when I'm running or whatever. And it just, it's stories of people who have achieved financial independence through real estate. And it keeps you inspired and it keeps you feeling and knowing that it can be done, right? Because you hear about these other people that have done it, they also share their mistakes. And so um, I like to keep that on my, um, on my podcasts. It's all, almost like building your community, just hearing people that are walking the same path. Awesome, Emily. Awesome, so any questions you guys before we wrap this up today? So, I'm curious about your property in Maine, because um, I've also thought about investing elsewhere because Cape Cod is crazy expensive right now. Yep. Um, so you're not going to even break even, most likely, between your mortgage and, you know, taking care of the property and everything. Um, so how did you find that area and do you manage that yourself or do you have a property manager or? Yeah, so um, actually, um, speaking of bigger pockets. Mm -hmm. They also have an online community where they have a lot of forums and things. So oh. it's a paid membership. I, I did pay something for it. I think it was like $300 for the year. Mm -hmm. But I joined because I wanted that kind of like intel, that kind of market information. And that's where I heard about Waterville, Maine. Mm -hmm. And it was one of the places where you could achieve the 1% rule, which is where your gross monthly income is 1% of the purchase price. Okay. And that's kind of a rule of thumb for knowing that you're going to have a positive cash flow. And so, you know, I did my homework. I looked into it. Um, I found a great realtor there through my network. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah. And so um, I worked with him and we screened a lot of properties. And the one we eventually bought was one of his listings. So we kind of knew about it for everyone else, which is perfect. <laughs> we didn't get into a bidding war. Um, and it's a great duplex. And, um, and we did hire a property manager. So um, that was referred to us by the realtor. And, um, and so far, so good. Um, it's yearly? One of the thing, what's that? Is it a yearly rental? Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's not a vacation um, rental it's just a yearly they, Colby College is up there okay so there's a good um there's a good rental market okay awesome yeah and and just a good example of why property managers 
are so helpful. So I went in there and I was like, oh, I want to, you know, redo the kitchen and redo the floors and knock down this wall. And the lady was like, no, you don't. She's like, you're not going to see a return on that investment for like 20 years. She's like, we're going to paint. <laughs> we're going to, you know, do some really light fixing up and we're going to put it on the market and rent it for you. So she really reeled me back in and was like, no, this is a business. We're not going to spend a lot of your money. And it was really helpful to yeah, have that reason. kind of voice of reason, just someone who's immersed in it and does it every day. And it's like, no, this is what we're doing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'd be tempted to be like, oh, let's make it beautiful. And then, you know, the college kids just like wear and tear. <laughs> and it's just money down the drain. Mm -hmm. You got to think of it as a business. So, um, yeah, so I like that market. I think I'm going to go back and do more there. Um, I'm looking at more opportunities now. I mean, New Hampshire also has some great markets that are cheaper to get into and have good ROIs. Um, another market I'm looking at is actually Tulum, Mexico, near Cancun. Um, the property prices there are not bad. And, I mean, you know, the vacation uh, tourism market there is amazing so uh, as soon as we open up and can travel again I think I'm gonna go check it out <laughs> yeah I'm interested in potentially in Florida my parents have a house down there yeah uh, somewhere in that area like a little condo or a little two-bedroom house or something like that yeah which area do you know uh, they are near the villages but not in them so they're in that neighborhood, um, kind of south of Ocala. It's a horse country in a Del Webb community. And they bought it the, like the day after my mom turned 55. So that's not that oh, wow. far away for me now. <laughs> <laughs> and it's been a great investment for them. And they go down there in the winter, they've rented it in the off season to people that, you know, they're building a house and they need a place for a little while or that kind of thing. Um, Got it. Yeah. yeah, I mean, that sounds really good, especially right now in February. <laughs> uh -huh. Well, they didn't go this year, but <laughs> most years. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. So, yeah, it would be great to have a place near them, too, in case, you know, if it yeah. wasn't rented, we could go down there, you know. Yeah. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Any other questions? Well, any other questions? Super helpful, Carrie. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome, Lisa. Thank you. Are you, you going to have more meetings? Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, yes. So um, I actually have a bunch of webinars planned for the whole year. So um, I will send out the full event calendar. Um, some of them are geared toward invest being an investor landlord, sorry, an absentee landlord. So you're not living in the property. And some of them are more geared toward if you're actually like house tacking, which means you live in the property, rent out other units. Um, so, and I think there's also one about the Burr method, which is something I touched on earlier where you buy and then renovate and then refinance and pull out money to buy another property. Okay. So all these are proven strategies for building wealth over time. So um, yeah, so I'll send you, I'll send you the full event calendar. And I also have a YouTube channel. So I have a lot of recordings from past webinars too. It's all simple. And, close. and let's talk, let's talk one-to-one -one and, and figure out a good strategy. Sounds like a plan. Yeah, yeah. It does. So I hope you guys all um, go ahead and read this book. Whoops, both of these books. <laughs> Which one's the other one? This That's is book. My, my book that I wrote. It's called You Can Have It All in with Real Estate. It's on Amazon. Okay. You know, and then it's a very introductory guide to investing. Um, this one is the one we've been discussing today, The Re Billionaire Real Estate Investor by Gary Keller. It's um, a very detailed kind of manual for building wealth. And it's based on hundreds of thousands of investors' experiences. 
becoming financially independent. I think I saw that on Audible. Yeah, I'm sure it's on Audible as well as Amazon and anywhere else probably you can buy books. Um, yeah, oh. I love listening to stuff on Audible, it's helpful. But it does have um, some visuals in it too. So, you know, there's a lot of like visual stuff too. So, oh, okay. yeah. What's the bag? <laughs> it's something that I've read over and over. So it's a good thing just to have on your shelf. Good reference book. Thank you, Carrie. I appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. It's heading so in this direction. Good. I just, it was helpful to get the little overview from someone who's done it. So I will check that sure. out. <laughs> awesome. I really appreciate your time. I hope you stay warm today and, mm -hmm. um, and take an action step in the next 24 hours to move, move forward. Excellent. Thank cool. you. Thank All you. Right. See you guys soon. Bye. Bye. Take care. Bye. Do the whole thing like that. Mm -hmm.